Welcome. We're going to talk today about some critical issues that health systems face, as well as about some important matters concerning how health systems are financed in relation to the goals they seek to achieve. By the time you finish this session, you should be able to discuss some of the key issues in the health systems of low- and middle-income countries, speak comfortably about the meaning of universal health care and the efforts to expand it to more countries, note the meaning of results-based financing and comment on basic principles for its use, as well as comment on selected points related to the financing of health systems. We can look first at the WHO Health Systems Framework, which talks about the outcomes and goals that systems seek to achieve, the ways in which different inputs are combined to achieve them. And let's focus in this session on some of the critical health systems issues that countries face, and all countries face them, but particularly low and middle income countries. So let's start with leadership and governance. Um, Rachel, if you would, what are some of the important leadership and governance issues that some, uh, if not all, countries face, but especially, let's say, low and middle income countries? Sometimes generating sufficient political will to get important health reforms passed can be a major challenge. And what do you mean by political will? Um, people in positions of power, specific in the legislative or executive branch, have to be committed to health reform and have to have a coalition of people around them who are also committed to it. Or to making the health system work, right? Uh, Elizabeth, what other key leadership and governance issues might arise in countries? Uh, in some cases, the leadership or governance might be in a bureaucratic framework that might encourage things like corruption or um, bribery. Uh, in some cases, leaderships don't necessarily have the means to achieve their ambitions or they've set them too high because they don't have the experience of implementing certain health pro uh, programs, but all or of those not, things. Or they may, pardon me, may not have the uh, number of staff they need. Yes. They may not have the quality of staff they need. The staff might not be trained. They may not have the bureaucratic systems in place, et cetera, needed to carry out their work effectively and efficiently, even if they have strong desires to do so. Now. Um, Health workforce issues, often t uh, people talk about human resources for health, but health workforce issues are also very common in all countries. And Shailen, what are some of the most prominent health workforce issues that arise in low and middle income countries? I think a big one that um, comes to mind immediately <coughs> is, is brain drain and the issue of people um, maybe being trained in country or trained out of country, but then not returning to um, their own country to um, to practice and therefore having kind of a dearth of, um, of health staff at multiple levels. Indeed, brain drain for a number of countries is really fundamental. Emily, what would you say are some of the other critical health workforce issues? Um, I would say a shortage of properly trained people can be a problem as well as just worker absenteeism. People who are supposed to show up to a certain site on certain days but aren't there. And of course we want uh, the right staff train the right way to be distributed in ways that are necessary to enable the achievement of good health outcomes and incentivized enough that they feel uh, like they want to come to work and are willing to work hard and sometimes there are some important gaps in that. When we think, uh, Rachel, about health financing, what are some of the most important concerns that arise there? Often in low and middle income countries, it's difficult for governments to generate sufficient revenue, especially if their tax systems aren't well run. Sometimes they just don't have enough money. Uh, in low and middle income countries, uh, they, they may not have effective or efficient tax systems, but even if they do, the tax base might be fairly narrow and they can't raise enough money and they need to find ways in which they can generate more funds. Uh, they also, in many countries, there are opportunities uh, for improving the effectiveness and efficiency of different investments by investing, changing some priorities. Uh, health management information systems are uh, always talked about. Um, many countries have developed health management information systems that are more effective and efficient than they had earlier. But in others, there are still really critical gaps. If the desire to have a computerized health information system with a computer and a link to the rest of the system at every point of service in the country. This is very difficult in low resource settings in which the 
lowest level of the health system might often be in quite remote places, sometimes with poor transport, uh, uh, less than 24-hour day electricity, et cetera. And uh, again, there's been some really important progress in the development and utilization of health management information systems, but there are really still a large number of gaps that, um, that uh, occur. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, let, me, let me, yeah, Elizabeth, when we think about medical products, vaccines, and technologies, again, thinking largely, let's say, even of the poorest countries, the lowest resource countries, if you were the minister, what would some of your concerns be? And what, are, what are the areas where you would try to improve um, the effectiveness and efficiency of your system with respect to these matters? If I were a minister in a low and middle income country, I might not have the money to pay for the drugs that I need, the vaccines that I need. So a big concern is where am I going to find the money to finance these essential medicines? Another big question is, given that I have limited resources, which should I prioritize? Good. And Shailen, what else would you worry about when you're thinking about the supply chain of drugs, equipment, vaccines, diagnostics? Well, I think that um, when you think about kind of getting drugs to people, there is an inefficient um, <coughs> or lack of efficient systems in place to do that. Um, and establishing those supply chains of how you get, you know, drugs that may need to be kept cold out to rural areas um, is really difficult when you might not even have good roads. Right. I mean, all, all of these would surely arrive. Countries have to make decisions about uh, they have to, wh what, what products to select, uh, how they're going to purchase them at least possible cost, uh, it, and to be sure they're of sufficient quality and that they're not counterfeit. They have to be able to distribute them. They have to be able to store them. Sometimes they have to store them, as Shailen has said, uh, uh, and keep them cold while they're doing so. They have to get them to the patients with well-trained providers who know how to use them. And then they have to be sure, of course, patients are actually using them properly. And this is always complicated and, uh, and difficult. So um, when we combine these inputs in hopes of achieving these out outcomes, of course, what we have to worry about is really referred to in many respects in the middle. And that is, what is the extent to which the system is working in a way that provides access, that motivates people to use the system, and protects the people uh, uh, financially at the same time, while providing services, of course, that are of sufficient quality and that are safe. Now, let me make just a few comments about only a small number of the concerns that the students so nicely raised about issues that different uh, countries face. So one of, one of the ways in which some countries have sought to address health workforce issues is through what we call task shifting. And task shifting is defined by the World Health Organization. And forgive me, but I'll, but I'll read it so it helps hopefully to sink in. The rational redistribution of tasks among health workforce teams. Specific tasks are moved where appropriate from highly qualified health workers to health workers with shorter training and fewer qualifications in order to make more efficient use of the available human resources for health. And let me give you an example, and there are several very good ones, which the evidence has shown can work to produce good outcomes in efficient ways. In the worst resourced countries, there are not enough physicians, and there's certainly not enough specialists. And two areas where they're really lacking in specialists might be obstetrics and gynecology on the one hand, and ophthalmology on the other. Let's look at eye care for a second. And what you find is cataracts are highly prevalent everywhere as people age. But, in, but what happens in uh, some of today's low and middle income countries, in fact, is the onset of cataracts is earlier than it is in high income countries. But because of the lack of health care services, and especially the lack of ophthalmologists, many people are needlessly blind because they can't avail of really relatively simple surgery that's also very inexpensive to remove the cataract and help to restore their sight. If these countries wait until they have enough ophthalmologists to get surgery to all the people who need them, it's going to be a long time. So in many countries, what they're doing is taking advantage of what's called ophthalmic assistance. And these are people who are not surgeons, but who are trained to do simple cataract surgery over and over and over again in a high quality way under the supervision of an ophthalmologist in order that they can get to that backlog 
of, uh, of cataracts which need surgery but couldn't otherwise get it. Much the same case is true in obstetrics and gynecology where in many of the low resource countries fewer women get cesarean suction than need them and many women in fact die as a result of their inability to access emergency obstetric care when they need them. A number of countries have trained uh, obstetric assistants who can perform some basic surgery on women like cesarean section when they need it in places where there aren't sufficient numbers of obstetri obstetricians and gynecologists and they've learned to do this repetitively to a high level of quality under the training of competent people and under their supervision as well. And there's a fair amount of evidence, there's I think a reasonable amount of evidence on this and I encourage you to go and look. In psychiatry as well you'll see now that there's an important movement globally in low resource countries to try to embed basic diagnosis, referral, and treatment more at the community level in places where it's very clear they won't for many years be able to, uh, even if they wanted to, carry out a model of psychiatric services that's based on the availability of psychiatrists. I've been in countries with I think 40 or 50 million people that only had five or six psychiatrists at the time. Clearly that is not going to be a basis for the provision of psychiatric care and some notions of task shifting will have to be incorporated into their approach to get such care. Let's also talk a little bit about contracting. Now, uh, I'm not going to, one way of contracting is one level of government might formally literally contract with another to try to um, incentivize a better, more effective, more efficient achievement of outcomes. But I want to talk a little bit more about contracting out. And this is when a financing agency provides resources to a non-state provider, like a contractor, to provide a specified level of services with specified objectives. Now, let's take a country uh, like Bangladesh, for example, which has a quite well-developed health system, but which also has an unusually well-developed uh, array of non-governmental organizations. And those non many of those non some of the non-governmental organizations have a very wide presence in Bangladesh and some very effective and efficient health programs of their own. It might turn out in countries like Bangladesh where your health system is working but not as effectively and efficient as you want or not across all domains, but where you have options of other actors who are actually providing good services, it might make most sense for you and the government to contract out those services. So that if, for example, BRAC, a very well-known NGO in Bangladesh, uh, is able to deliver good TB care in many villages in Bangladesh, it might make most sense for the government to actually contract BRAC to provide TB care in exchange for the government. The government would pay them to do this. But when it does so, even if you have a well-regarded NGO with whom you're contracting, you want to be sure as the government that you very clearly delineated with your, with your contractor exactly what is to be achieved uh, and how you'll know when it's been achieved, which often uh, might depend on independent uh, verification or validation, and how money will flow out of respect for the achievement of these objectives. Certainly we've learned that those are the circumstances under which contracting out is most likely to work effectively and efficiently. Now another approach that people are, that countries are trying to take these days and actually taking quite a bit is called results-based financing. This is a very uh, interesting, very much used approach this, these days. Uh, a large numbers of, a number of countries are using results-based financing and I want to very much encourage you to take a deeper look uh, at this. Now, results-based financing can be any program that rewards the delivery of one or more outcomes by one or more incentives, financial or otherwise, after it has been verified that the agent has delivered the agreed upon results. When we think about results-based financing, it's really important to think about who gets paid the incentive, what are the actions, outputs, and outcomes for which you're going to pay them, how are you going to know whether or not these have actually been achieved? And what's the nature of the incentive? How big is it? How are you sure that it's the right one? Should it be monetary or non-monetary? 
and how do you ensure that people don't game the system, for example, and that this is going to work well? Now, uh, one can use results-based financing on the supply side, as we call it, or on the demand side. On the demand side, um, a number of countries use what are called conditional cash transfers. And these conditional cash transfer programs are programs that provide cash payments usually to poor households that meet certain behavioral requirements often related to children's health and or education. Two of the most important such programs and really the pioneers in this business in lots of ways are Brazil's Bolsa Familial and uh, Mexico's Oportunidades program. In these cases, and these are in a sense our welfare schemes that go beyond health and education, they're trying to help uplift people from poverty and help them to do that partly by ensuring that the children of these families are well nourished, healthy, and well educated. Uh, what these programs do is they provide a certain amount of money monthly in a way in exchange for the family guaranteeing that they take the child to well baby care, that the child is vaccinated, that the mother watches certain health uh, promotion uh, videos when she's in the clinic, that the children are enrolled in school and attend at least a certain number of days, uh, et cetera. And in these cases, the programs are very much set up so that the obligations of the families are clearly delineated and the money in principle flows to the family only when their participation has been independently verified. I, the, the notion of conditional cash transfers has now spread very widely, widely and it's in use in a substantial number of countries. In India, for example, a country on which I first worked beginning in 1987, uh, there were historically significant issues with trying to get women, especially in the north, to deliver in hospitals in the hopes that hospital-based deliveries could in fact be safer for them. I think when I first worked on India in parts of the northern states in India, which are among the poorest states, I believe that uh, fewer than 20 percent of the women actually delivered in hospitals. And not so long ago, the Indians came up with a conditional cash transfer scheme that tried to incentivize hospital-based deliveries by rewarding families with some money if they in fact delivered in a hospital. Now, it's also possible, I'm sorry, Shailen, please go ahead. So for these conditional cash transfers, you said that they um, are kind of on the demand side. Um, I was wondering if you could just quickly summarize what that means right. and what the opposite for supply right. side is. So uh, conditional cash transfers operate on the side of trying to incentivize, incentivize and motivate people to engage in certain behaviors. When they talk about supply side incentives, which I, I, I was going, going to do now in fact, they're talking about incentives within the health system itself to get the health system to perform more effectively and efficiently. And in fact, the Indian case is a good one because the initial, for illustrating this, uh, the initial results of the Indian conditional cash transfer program were that more and more women and a larger share of women delivering did in fact come to hospitals. But initially the results, the evaluation showed this didn't have much of an impact on infant, uh, on infant and or maternal mortality because the system wasn't yet forgive my simplification, ready to provide high quality care to them. So what one might suggest and what the Indians have been working hard at in a variety of ways, I'm not sure it's supply side financing, you can imagine a country, let's say, and I won't talk about India, you can imagine a country in which more and more women were coming to hospitals as you wanted, the hospitals weren't yet equipped to provide high quality care, and so you might incentivize the hospitals through a supply side scheme, and that is, um, we will provide the hospitals with a certain proportion of their budget, but we're going to give them bonuses, uh, the, give them the rest of the budget, or bonuses for um, which they might use as they wish, or even some bonuses for individual staff, provided that they are able to achieve certain targets in terms of the provision of services itself. If you can deliver service A, service B, and service C to level of quality D, E, F, and G, 
uh, then you might get bonuses or you might get a, uh, additional money for your services as a, uh, as a whole. And in fact, the Argentines, uh, through Argentinians, through a program called Plan Nasser, uh, have combined a range of uh, demand side and supply side incentives. And Rwanda has organized uh, a, an important portion of its health system now uh, to take account of supply side incentives. And again, for both the demand and the supply side, for incentivizing people to behave certain ways or for incentivizing your health system to behave certain ways, it's really important, the evidence says, that what is the goals that you seek and the outcomes you seek must be clearly delineated. People need to understand what's being asked of them or that they're being incentivized to do. And at the same time, it's essential that uh, you have clear indicators for measuring whether or not the outcomes have been achieved and there are clearly articulated ways of independently verifying their achievement. And it's only when that's happened does the money actually flow. Now, um, again, uh, this is very much in fashion. Uh, demand and supply side uh, approaches to results-based financing are quite widely used now. There's a lot of uh, good and increasing amount of evidence about how this is working, and I want to encourage everyone to take a look at this and to follow it as it continues to evolve over time. More and more countries are also making progress in a quest to achieve universal health coverage. And by that we mean ensuring that all people can use the promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative health services they need of sufficient quality to be effective while also ensuring that the use of these services does not expose the user to financial hardship. In a sense this is kind of the ultimate way of saying that countries seek to achieve the outcomes that we saw when we looked at the WHO uh, healthcare framework. Now, the World Health Organization has put together a framework as well for thinking about universal health coverage. Uh, those who work in global health call this the coverage box. And it might look complicated, but it's actually not that complicated at all. As countries consider their move to universal health coverage, they have to consider three important questions. The first is, who is to be covered? The second is, what services are to be covered, and the third is what proportion of program costs should also be covered. Obviously, in an ideal world, everybody would be covered for a very substantial array of services, and they wouldn't have to pay very much to do that. But in fact, uh, the world is more complicated than that, and almost no country has the resources needed to fill this box completely. But as countries seek to achieve universal health coverage, they're now more and more wrestling with those questions and trying to expand the number of people who are covered, expand the number of services for which they're covered, while reducing the amount of money they have to pay for those services and trying to ensure that they don't suffer financial risk. Of course, countries have to consider as well how they're going to pay for universal health coverage. And this is difficult. Will they finance this from taxes? Will there be a special tax? Will there be a sin tax? Will they raise some new value-added taxes or raise value-added taxes as they've done in Ghana? Or should they or even could they raise the money for universal health coverage from premiums from employers or employees or both? Countries also have to keep in mind and help uh, people within these countries to understand kind of the basic principles of insurance arrangements which include prepayment, risk pooling, and trying to reduce out-of-pocket payments. Rachel? Uh, this is what do you mean by value-added taxes? So in many countries in the world, and I, I know best for example the uh, high-income countries of Europe, what they do is uh, in, in, they have what's called a value-added tax. As, as goods are manufactured, at, uh, they are taxed at different stages of manufacturing. So at the end of the process, they have a value-added tax, often referred to as a VAT, that might in fact be something like 20% of the total cost of the goods. In the United States, uh, in which we live, uh, we don't have value-added taxes. 
we use sales taxes, sometimes at the municipal level, sometimes at the state level. And, uh, and a number of countries uh, have these value-added taxes. And sometimes people, some, a number of countries might, for example, wish to raise the value-added tax, since that's one of their primary ways of raising revenue, in order to raise revenue for implementing a broader scheme of universal health coverage. Emily, you have a question, yeah, too. Yeah, could you explain a sin tax, please? Sorry. Uh, I, this, a sin tax uh, is a very colloquial way of referring, for example, to taxes on bad behavior. And usually we think of sin taxes as taxes on alcohol or tobacco. And what some countries might wish to do is say, well, as we seek to improve the health of our population, Let's raise some revenue to do that by raising taxes on bad health behaviors, such as tobacco consumption or alcohol consumption. And then we have a nice philosophical and logical way of saying to our population, we can accomplish two things. By raising the price of uh, tobacco and alcohol through taxation, we can discourage you from smoking or drinking in excess, which we all hopefully agree uh, is a good aim. And at the same time, by doing that, we can take the money that we've raised from those particular taxes in the health sector and use them to help encourage and promote better, he uh, better health throughout, throout the country as a whole. So is that a clear, uh, Emily and, and Rachel? Yeah. Now, let me just show you another graphic to highlight the point that I was making that there's really a quest now by almost every country to make progress in universalizing health coverage, ensuring that more and more of their people get access to a pa an agreed package of care of sufficient quality in ways that don't cause them financial hardship. If we thought about um, a decade or two ago, we would have found a world in which not very many countries other than high resource countries had achieved universal health coverage and not so many other countries would have been seeking to achieve it. But I'm happy to say that we're now living in a world in which many, many countries are making progress towards achieving universal health coverage, uh, even though some of them have to start out relatively slowly. And this includes low-resource countries. For example, Ghana, in one way, and Rwanda in another, have made very substantial progress in universalizing health coverage. And as we look at this chart, which I have to tell you is a little bit outdated, but I think still quite helpful, we see here the percentage of the population that's covered, and here what uh, some might describe in rather subjective ways as uh, uh, early implementation, middle implementation, or more advanced implementation. And if we, had, if we showed this graphic and how it evolved over time, what we'd see is that the world is very much moving in this, that countries, many countries, are very much moving in this direction. More and more countries are adopting universal health coverage. More and more are wrestling with the difficult issues of universal health coverage, like raising enough money to do it, expanding coverage, and ensuring that there's sufficient quality that you get good outcomes. But uh, this is an area of immense interest to those who work in global health. It's an area of great attention for many countries now, and an area where substantial progress with a considerable challenges uh, is being made. Let's talk now about two very uh, simplified but important points concerning uh, health financing. Now, let me show you first a graphic that looks at uh, health expenditure as a percent of GDP, gross domestic product, and can relate that to gross domestic product per capita. Now, generally, as countries get richer, moving along here, we expect for a number of reasons that they'll spend more uh, on health. It's not a perfect correlation, but we would expect it because people have more to spend, the cost of health services is higher, and uh, people's demands are higher. And also, uh, countries that have more money tend to spend more on technology, and technology pushes up the price, even though it may have great benefits. Now, this correlation isn't perfect, but what we see out here, for example, is um, Germany. Up here we have very high income countries in Germany and Iceland. And they spend relatively higher shares of their national income on health compared to a number of these other countries. And here we have 
usually some relatively poorer countries that spend substantially less on health. But you also have countries like, um, this is Saudi Arabia, which uh, spends relatively low compared to its per capita income. And then we have countries like, um, this one is uh, purple. Somebody help me on that one. Brazil, Brazil which is not, um, whose income per, per capita is uh, about 10,000 US dollars equivalent, but which clearly is making a substantial effort in health and spending close to 10% of its GDP. So in principle, though the correlation is not perfect, what we expect to find is that as countries get better off, they will tend to spend relatively more, but there will still be some countries, even with fewer resources, which make special efforts in health and might be spending more than we would expect, as well as some countries which in principle might be able to afford more, but aren't spending as much as we might think uh, they could or they should. Now let's, with this in mind, look at another graphic. And what this graphic does is compare health expenditure with life expectancy. On this axis, you have life expectancy in 2012. And on this axis, you have total expenditure on health as a share of GDP. Now, Emily, in principle, how would you expect life expectancy to vary with national income per capita? Um, you might hope that life expectancy would increase as income increases. And, and you would probably expect it, right? You would expect people in higher income countries to live longer than people in low income countries. But Elizabeth, if you, I keep asking Elizabeth to be the minister of a country, but Elizabeth, if you were the minister of, of health or finance in a low income country and you were looking at this, where would you want to be on this graphic? And what would your goal be as the minister in terms of promoting the best possible health for your people? Well, if I were a minister of finance or health in a low or middle income country, I would want to spend as little as possible mm -hmm. in terms of percentage of GDP, uh, but to get the highest uh, returns, which would be a high life expectancy. So what Elizabeth says is if she were the minister of finance of a low resource country, she would like to be uh, she would sadly be in here in income terms, but what she would like to do is be up here in life expectancy terms. What she'd like to do by addressing the social determinants of health, addressing key risk factors, widely, wisely investing in health uh, in areas that yield high returns, hopefully at relatively low cost in ways that are doable and sustainable and that focus on the poor. What Elizabeth would like to do is be able to say to the president, Madam President, I am pleased to inform you that we have been able in our country to achieve a life expectancy almost as high as most of the high income countries. But we have been able to achieve it for a very small share of our national product spent on health because under your leadership, we've been able to make such prudent investments in the nutrition of our people, the education of our people, in water sanitation, and the key risk factors for health and health promotion. And now, by combining those investments wisely, we actually achieve a lot by spending relatively little. And, and Shailen, by contrast, uh, if you were the minister, where would you most not want to be in this graphic? I would not want to have a low life expectancy that costs a lot. Right. So what Shailen says very, very correctly is, uh, Madam President, what I want to assure you as the Minister of Finance of your country is that we will not fall into the trap of some other countries which spend a lot of money on health, but for a variety of reasons, maybe failure to address social determinants, maybe a failure to invest wisely in the most effective and efficient high yield investments, wind up spending a lot and getting relatively little in return. We want to emulate Elizabeth's country and despite our relatively important lack of resources, we want to enable long and healthy lives. We do not want to be where some other countries are, which is they might spend uh, a lot of money on health and yet have relatively lower life expectancy than many other countries have. This is highly stylized and exaggerated, like a lot of the examples 
that I try to give in ways that bring out important points in relatively simple ways, that it's really fundamental to understand that in all of these cases, what you want to do, and what every country would want to do, is enable the longest and healthiest possible life for their people by spending as little as possible to achieve it. And that will require that they invest as wisely as possible in social determinants, risk factors, uh, and related matters. We've covered a lot in this session. You should now have a much better understanding, hopefully than you had before, of some of the key health sector issues and a selected number of approaches that countries have taken to address them. At the same time, I hope you've kept in mind and you'll be able to keep in mind the last point that we made concerning some of the basics of health expenditure and the desires of all countries to achieve the best possible health at the least possible cost. In the next session, we'll talk about health disparities.